I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's June 27th, and we have a lot to talk about. Today, we're going to wrap up our coverage of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Congress that took place just a couple of weeks ago in Vienna. If you happen to miss last week's episode of the podcast, I'll recommend that you listen to that episode of Real Talk MS, episode number 303, before you listen to this episode, and you'll find a link to episode 303 in today's show notes. This scientific congress brought together nearly 200 international MS experts and MS leaders, including people affected by progressive MS, to report and review the progress being made in developing new effective treatments for progressive MS. The presentations and discussions were deep dives into topics that included understanding the mechanisms of MS progression, neuroprotection, remyelination, and biomarkers. As someone who was affected by progressive MS, I'll just say that these topics are the topics that people affected by progressive MS would clearly label as most urgent. As the second day of the Scientific Congress got underway, I had a chance to catch up with Professor Xavier Montalban. Professor Montalban shared his thoughts on the role of the International Progressive MS Alliance and talked about what we had seen and heard during the first day of the Congress. Professor Xavier Montalban is chair of the Department of Neurology and director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center of Catalonia at Valdebron University Hospital and chief of the Neuroimmunology Research Group at Valdebron Research Institute. Among his many accomplishments, Professor Montalban led a clinical trial of ocrelizumab, and that, of course, led to the availability of Ocrevus, the first DMT approved for treating progressive MS. More recently, Professor Montalban was a principal investigator in the phase two clinical trial for evobrutinib, a potential treatment for relapsing remitting MS. Evobrutinib is an oral disease modifying therapy, and it actually represents a new category of disease modifying therapy called BTK inhibitors. Welcome back to the podcast, Professor Montalban. Thank you, John. You've been a longtime member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. How would you characterize the alliance and the value that it brings to the MS community? Well, I think, I think the, the, the right word is the alliance. So it's an alliance between patients and scientists, which is uh, fantastic, right? I think it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to pull together a number of um, uh, stakeholders if uh, stakeholders are scientists, clinician scientists, and also patients. We're about halfway through this scientific congress with another day ahead of us today. Among the presentations that we heard yesterday, what stands out to you? What's been your takeaway from day one of the congress? So my takeaway was that um, we had two brilliant reviews by Tania Kuhlman and Hass Lassman. And was, to me, it was amazing to check how the concepts we had years ago. Suddenly, you realize there is a flow and you have a history if you un- and you understand much better the mechanisms of neurodegeneration. To me, that was very remarkable. And then we had a number of um, uh, short uh, presentations, uh, very, very focused on, on, clean- on basic research. And I don't want to highlight any of them because all of them were really very good and represent the four coming from many different countries with uh, different ideas as well. I think a question that might be on the minds of a lot of our listeners is you come to something like this, you hear this wonderful uh, presentation one after another, really brilliant presentations. What happens next? Do you see actionable steps coming out of this scientific congress? Absolutely. For instance, yesterday I, I saw a poster about clinical trials, and this morning I was here at 7 just to to read carefully that poster. I took a picture, I sent it to my my people there in Barcelona, 
uh, look at this, look at this, uh, we, we should discuss this way of running trials. Just to give you one example, I think people um, uh, uh, listen and then think and then try to apply what they have learned during this day. So I think, I think this is going to happen for the next weeks. What would you want people living with progressive MS to know about the current state of progressive MS research? So the, the first thing is that um, we, are, we are preventing disease progression. I, and I think that this is very clear. And uh, the, the prognosis now this is nothing to do with the prognosis 20 years ago. And I think this is a message for the uh, patients who have been diagnosed recently. I think the, the prognosis is going to be much, much better in general. The second one is that we are, in fact, doing something already in, in our clinical practice. And you realize that it's not, it's not really a spectacular, but uh, for instance, the PIRA, we can decrease the percentage of PIRA if you treat the patients well enough or good enough. So, and then the, the, the last message is that there is a tremendous effort uh, in research trying to um, identify the different mechanisms leading to neurodegeneration. And step by step, we are starting new phase one, phase two, and even phase three trials trying to deal with that. You know, over the last day and a half, I think uh, a lot of my listeners have heard that word mechanism over and over again. And I, I guess uh, I should just take a moment to point out that when you identify a mechanism, it becomes a target for therapy. Now you have something specific that you can go in and find treatment for to resolve it. Correct, correct. Well, the, 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 if you remember, John, when uh, the first uh, disease, um, disease modifiers that we used 20, 25 years ago, we didn't know how they work, right? Interference, uh, even glutaromeral sedate, we said it's a pleiotropic effect, which means that we have no idea about how they work. And now we are using more and more specific um, molecules with a very specific um, action, anti-CD20, um, you know, S1P modulators, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to happen more and more. And now, as you said, the BTK inhibitors is a new class molecule. Let's see what happens. But uh, there are, as you know, 11 trials, 11, 12 trials, phase three, trying to identify if these molecules work well, not only in relapsing MS, but also in progressive MS. That's good news. Uh, Professor Montalban, thank you for all you continue to do to improve the lives of people living with MS. And thanks so much for making it an early morning today and talking with me. Thank you very much, John. A pleasure, as always. In previous episodes of this podcast, we've talked about the importance of identifying biomarkers for MS. And the International Progressive MS Alliance has been focused and vocal on the importance of identifying a biomarker that would indicate MS progression. This would not only be beneficial in terms of MS treatment, but would be a real difference maker in how you would go about designing a clinical trial to test potential treatments for progressive MS. Professor David Leppert presented a deep dive on two different proteins that continue to show promise as potential biomarkers, neurofilament light chain and glial fibrillary acidic protein, or GFAP for convenience sake. Professor Leppert and I talked about how having a reliable biomarker for MS progression might impact MS treatment and MS research. Professor David Leppert is an associate professor in neurology at the University of Basel, where he founded the Clinical Neuroimmunology Laboratory. If I shared all of Professor Leppert's remarkable credentials, this would be a very long introduction. Many of you may be interested in knowing that while he was at Roche, Professor Leppert led the development of Ocrevus. Today, he's the chief medical officer at Genero a biopharmaceutical company focused on understanding and stopping the causal factors driving the progression of neurodegenerative and autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Leppert. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you. 
About an hour ago, you shared a presentation on neurofilament light chain and GFAP. If you're a regular listener, you've heard any number of conversations on this podcast about neurofilament light chain as a potential biomarker for MS. Mm -hmm. Just to bring all of our listeners up to speed, Professor Leppard, can I ask you to explain what a biomarker is? A biomarker is either um, a feature from imaging or coming out of a biofluid that relates to a clinical finding. So in the context of multiple sclerosis, disability or future disability can be measured by imaging with a lesion burden or the brain atrophy or with certain features like neurofilament and GFAP uh, in biofluids. Can you share a bit about the research you're currently involved in? Yes. Th um, we are looking on what neurofilament light chain actually delivers for patients. So this is a cytoskeleton product, and if a, a neuron is damaged, then this cytoskeleton product is released, comes into the cerebrospinal fluid, and later in, into the blood circulation where we can measure it and quantify it. The question is, what is the message of that result? One is... Uh, of acute inflammation. So high levels of neurofilament indicate acute inflammation. And this is also the case when you do not see anything in the MRI. So a lot of MS patients are affected by spinal cord lesions. They are normally not imaged, but this is captured by neurofilament light chain increase. So this is a more comprehensive uh, biomarker than what we have with MRI and it is also more timely so MRI is basically making a, an image of past damage whereas neurofilament in, in blood measures acute flames so it's a real time marker of inflammation so that provides information one day to the clinician who can initiate treatment much sooner Yes. So I'm, in principle, an advocate of uh, early treatment, so hit hard, hit early, because there is no reason to delay the right therapy to MS patients, because what is lost on structure will not be resurrected. So waiting is not a good option. And of course, if a physician is in doubt about the current status of a patient, measurement of neurofilament light chain is yet another brick of evidence to uh, convince that uh, you should start with a high efficacy therapy and not wait. We're talking about neurofilament light chain as a potential biomarker for MS. How would that impact clinical trials? And I think you've begun to answer how it might impact clinical practice. Yeah. So, I spoke about clinical practice uh, in making the diagnosis of an acute state of inflammation. Uh, it impacts also clinical practice in terms of uh, demonstrating drug efficacy because neurofilament light chain will normalize under effective treatment. And uh, most of uh, the latest trials have adopted uh, neurofilament light chain as a, a secondary endpoint of evidence of drug efficacy. So by seeing that measure of neurofilament light chain decrease, we can understand that a particular therapy is working. Is working or is insufficiently working. Right, right. The International Progressive MS Alliance has really brought the world together to solve the riddle of progressive MS. How important do you see international collaboration in MS research? Uh, I think it's a, a prerequisite uh, for future success. Disease progression in MS is a difficult task to, to solve. We have very little therapeutically. We do not anticipate correctly which direction an individual patient will take. So will, it, will she or he remain stable or will progress, etc. And these these tasks can only be addressed by international collaboration because each lab, each scientist has a specific skill and it is this connection 
that is a prerequisite for future success on a very difficult task. What would you want people affected by progressive MS to know about the current state of progressive MS research? I would like to convey that we make steady progress in order to understand progression as a phenomenon, specifically in a preclinical state, so before it has occurred. So that is the prerequisite for early intervention. Once we have uh, drugs that are more effective than the ones we have already. Currently, there is only one drug uh, licensed for primary progressive MS, another one for secondary progressive MS. But their mode of action is anti-inflammation. So it, it has somewhat a peripheral mode of action to impact the core of, of progression. And we are awaiting uh, new, new compounds, new approaches um, that will help likely in a combination therapy between an infl- in anti-inflammatory and an anti-neurodegenerative compound to ameliorate the, the perspectives of uh, patients with progression. Uh, Professor David Leppard, thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do to improve the lives of people who are living with MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Ann Cross is credited with discovering the role of B cells in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. That discovery, of course, led to the development of highly effective disease-modifying therapies that target B cells, treatments that include Ocrevus, Rituxan, and Kesimpta. Dr. Cross is also a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and I had an opportunity to talk with her about the role of the Alliance, the importance of international scientific collaboration, and some of the presentations that we had seen and heard during the first day of the Congress. Dr. Ann Cross is a professor of neurology and the Manny and Rosalind Rosenthal, Dr. John Trotter, MS Chair in Neuroimmunology at the Washington University School of Medicine. And Dr. Cross is also a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Cross. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Why is the International Progressive MS Alliance important when it comes to progressive MS research? Uh, I think it's important because, first of all, it is international, and we, there are great scientists all over this world, and it brings together uh, groups of them. And, um, this meeting has really shown that. I've seen a lot of uh, people talking about projects that are between two or even three or four countries, uh, and it's all aimed at progressive MS, which is where we need to put our focus as far as research and treatment is now, uh, I take care of patients too. And that's the group of patients who are uh, people with MS who are in most need of, of good treatments. And what's your role in the Alliance? I was asked by the National MS Society of the United States to represent them on the scientific board. And um, I guess that was three or four years ago. This is the first actual in-person meeting we've had, so I'm excited to be here. Well, I think uh, I think everybody is very, very happy to be getting back to face-to-face meetings again, for sure. We're through the first day of the Scientific Congress. Can you share some thoughts about what you've heard today? I have heard a lot of extremely interesting and varied uh, research projects focused on the uh, the problem of progression progression in the progressive biology in MS. I think one thing that has struck me is that most of the research has been focused actually on either MS neuropathology. Um, so I've been pleased that there's been a lot of focus really on people with the disease and tissues from people with the disease at this meeting. Uh, other things that I've uh, heard at this meeting that I found interesting, uh, several of the speakers have mentioned mitochondrial dysfunction, in uh, particularly in neurons and axons that are uh, underlying some of the pathobiology of progressive MS. Uh, in the last session, we heard about DNA damage in mitochondria, so mitochondria can divide and um 
they can have damage to their DNA, which can perpetuate a damage that may be harmful to axons. Uh, we've heard a lot about the need for remyelination and how important myelin is to the survival and health of axons. So uh, a lot of pressure on the idea of, of finding good treatments that will cause remyelination quickly. We heard some about toxic factors in the spinal fluid and how that might be causing damage uh, in periventricular regions, which are common areas for damage in MS, as well as in the cortex. There's uh, been some uh, work on uh, DNA of, of people with MS, uh, looking for reasons why patients may have a progression of their disease, whereas other people with MS may not have progression of disease. So looking for other genetic markers and including epigenetic markers. There was uh, some uh, focus on uh, microglia that surround some slowly expanding or slowly evolving smoldering lesions in progressive MS and um, their uptake of iron and that using that as an imaging signal to identify these particularly or at least thought to be particularly bad lesions in the brain of people with progressive MS biology. There's been a, some uh, sessions where people from industry have been involved and talked about from their perspective uh, what they would like to see and, and how they would like to work together to treat progressive MS. So that's been refreshing too. And another good thing about the International M Progressive MS Alliance is that it involves people who actually have the disease and the disease of MS that is. And uh, that's uh, so important because those are the people we're trying to, to help. And um, certainly those persons need to have a, a say in this. And um, because I'm a clinician too, I'm, I'm used to speaking with people who have progressive MS and understand um, the very acute need for treatments and also the wish by many of them to, to have a say in what we do in research. So that's, that's another refreshing thing about this particular group. That's something that I've always admired about the Alliance, that they bring all the stakeholders to the table literally together so that we have clinicians, we have research scientists, we have uh, industry, we have people who are affected by progressive MS, and uh, the exchange of ideas is so, so valuable. Uh, collecting all of those diverse perspectives uh, is so necessary at arriving at the kind of solutions that are really going to serve the patient population. Yes. Uh, another interesting thing is this meeting seems to involve people who've been in the, this investigative space for many years, like myself, as well as junior people who are just coming into the MS research arena and mid-career people. Uh, and that's kind of refreshing, too. And I've had the chance to talk to some young investigators and learn what they're doing, uh, which many of which are doing incredible things. And um, that certainly gives me a lot of hope for the future. Well, speaking of that, what, what would you want people affected by progressive MS to know about the current state of progressive MS research? Well, in terms of progressive MS research, I, I first of all tell a lot of my patients who happen to have the progressive subform, uh, that the whole field has really shifted focus now that we have many good therapies for the relapsing uh, subtype of MS, although there's probably a lot of overlap between relapsing and progressive uh, biology of MS. But nonetheless, people who have purely progressive disease and are progressing, I, I like to reassure them and give them hope because uh, people in the field are, have really turned their focus on progressive MS. Uh, the whole research endeavor in the MS world seems to have changed focus and um, in re realizing that people with progressive MS biology need help soon. Well, you know, I think that when the Alliance was first 
only a conversation among a few people back in 2010. And then seeing its launch a few years later, I think uh, that was always part of the mission to make progressive MS research a focus to, to raise its profile among the research community. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fo- uh, hopeful because I happen to have been in the field long enough to have seen. So I started practicing before we had any disease modifying therapies. And now we have over 20 and patients with early relapsing disease have have a great future, most of them. Uh, and so, you know, it's fun almost to diagnose MS in people because um if they have neurological problems, that is, because often the alternatives are much worse and we can treat MS and it's just so refreshing and, and nice to be able to t- discuss therapies. We have so many therapies that it it's almost problematic to choose among them, uh, but that's a good problem to have. So I've seen that transpire during my career so far. So I'm really, really hopeful that we're going to see uh, a similar uh plethora of treatments for progressive MS biology uh, in within a decade or so. Dr. Ann Cross, thank you for all you have done and continue to do to improve the lives of people who are living with MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm so happy to be at this meeting. The nearly 200 international MS experts weren't the only attendees at this scientific congress. Among the Congress attendees were some of the philanthropists who support the work of the Alliance. Manya Joblin's brother, Alan, lived with progressive MS. And when Manya and I had a chance to catch up, it became clear that Manya's journey as a caregiver shared some similarities with my journey as a caregiver. And we quickly found ourselves comparing notes as two former caregivers for loved ones who both lived with progressive MS. Manya Joblin was a caregiver for her brother, Alan, who lived with progressive MS, and she's one of the philanthropists who makes the work of the International Progressive MS Alliance possible. Welcome to the podcast, Manya. So great to be here, John. The Scientific Congress is coming to an end today. Let me ask you, what did you find the most interesting and the most inspiring? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because All of the scientists here are inspiring. I I just am so in admiration of all the work they do day to day. It's such a a slog to do this kind of detailed work and to keep the wide view of what they're doing and how it may affect people also in mind. And it's just such a privilege to, to be here and listen to them work and tell us about their work. Let me ask you, what motivated you to support the research the Alliance is doing? Uh, My brother lived with primary progressive MS for 43 years. He was diagnosed in 1978 when, gosh, they didn't even know that whether he had progressive or relapsing remitting at the time of his diagnosis. And of course, the family was always hoping if it never gets any worse than this, it'll be fine. That hope was obviously not well placed because we just didn't know. And for most of those years, there was no research into progressive MS. When the alliance was formed, it was just a gift to those of us who wanted to support research. I have to say that what I'm doing is really following in the footsteps of my parents who set up fundraising in the mid-80s and also followed in their footsteps in caregiving with my brother. So when the alliance was formed, I said we should be directing the funds that we raised to this new group because they're actually going to do something about the form of MS that Alan lives with. And so that's that's why we did it. What would you want our listeners to know about the International Progressive MS Alliance? That it is spectacular in its um, excellence. The, the way the group approaches research and approaches the scientists and approaches the projects that it must choose among is just so on point and they never lose focus of, of the point of it all. And um, 
I've, I've just never been in, seen a group be so well organized, and so well focused. And, um, gosh, it's just excellent. Everything about it is excellent. The people, the, um, the mission, their approach to it, and what they're accomplishing. All I can do is say yes to all of the above. I, I <laughs> completely mirror everything that you have to say about it. Your observations tend to be my observations. So I, th- I think they're doing, more than, they're, they're doing more than a few things right. <laughs> yes, they certainly are. I have to say, being here, my brother did um, die in 2021. And being here um, is bittersweet because it's... We don't know when the breakthroughs are going to come. The, the mini breakthroughs are coming all the time now, fast and furious. But big ones that are going to make real difference in um, people's longevity and ability really to live productively with progressive MS. Who knows when that's going to happen? But it's just, it's a little difficult to look forward to that and to celebrate it in advance, knowing that. Alan couldn't take part in it, but he couldn't take part in it from the time he was diagnosed because it was just too early on. The flip side of that is that um, I get to see and be reminded of all the work that goes into this, how long it takes, how detailed it has to be, and how each scientist builds on on all their colleagues. And I say, well, there are reasons why Alan couldn't partake. And uh, others will. So, bitter and sweet. Once again, all, all I can do is say, you tend to say what's on my mind oh. as well. <laughs> well, uh, I know you've lived through this, too. Absolutely. My wife uh, had, had some background in healthcare as a professional, and she was trained as a healthcare researcher. So, she understood uh. the runway necessary to get to the next step, to be able to to crack the code and figure out the riddle of progressive mm. MS. So I don't think there was ever any sense in our household that something was going to happen today. She was quite determined that I continue doing the work to make sure that other families didn't necessarily have to endure what your family and my family did. So yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad we're both here doing that work. I am too. When, um, when I was through with my caregiving, let's put it that way, I said, well, this has been meaningful and intense. And uh, what can I do with that experience? Because it's, uh, it was meaningful while Alan was alive, but can it be meaningful now as well? And so I'm, I've also been involved in the um, um, MS Friends uh, program as a, as a peer connection with other caregivers. And um, that's important. I know this is not about this alliance, but, but, the, but what I'm saying is um, I want to encourage caregivers to take advantage of as much that the society offers as the researchers can. I always like to remind my listeners, because I think I I tend to know it firsthand, as you do, that MS affects families, not just individuals. And you're absolutely right. I think it's so important that caregivers pay attention to the resources and support that is available to them. Uh, You know, the funny thing about MS is because of its progressive nature, I think very often at the beginning, the other family member can perhaps shrug their shoulders a bit and say, this isn't a big deal. Uh, if uh, you happen to be someone who's living with progressive MS, it, it becomes a big deal. And so the role of the caregiver sort of evolves as the disease progression continues. Yes, absolutely. And so I think even when we say to ourselves, doesn't seem like it's going to be a big deal, avail yourselves of, of those uh, support Uh, resources that are available because they will become important. Yes, yes. And families are are intricate. 
I mean, today's sessions, uh, this morning's sessions um, at the Alliance conference, conference has been a lot about biology, um, only a small amount of which I understood. Uh, but the intricacy of the work that's being done and the interconnectivity of not only project to project, you know, cells to cells and projects to projects has been impressive. That's true in families, too. I mean, we know relationships in families are intricate and different and um, uh, combine all sorts of, of, well, a universe of things. Um, all of that is um, intensified during illness and especially with MS, with the uncertainty of what's happening day to day or year to year. So you can't underestimate how much... Uh, you may need to lean on other people, and the society is there to help you. You know, as you were talking about some of the intricate science being discussed and how much of it a, a lay person might grasp, here's what I always found to be true. Sitting in sessions where the science gets pretty complex, I, I always try to, personally, I try to circle back, do a little homework so I can, I can explain it on this podcast a little bit. But even before I was doing that, you know what I always took away was the passion and commitment that these experts, these scientists bring to the work. It is so clear that it is not just their job. Yes. It, it, and, and that in itself, I think, was very reassuring to me. And frankly, one of the reasons that I, I try to include so many of these experts on episodes of the podcast because I think that uh, sometimes we 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 have this image of the scientist in their in their lab coat uh, in, in in a rather uh, sterile setting and uh, the fact is they're they're quite human they have passion for the work that they do and and that drives them and we need that kind of drive when you're trying to unravel something as you know we talk about the science being complex well progressive ms is complex absolutely and they have to have passion because it's such a difficult job it's difficult to get to do the job because you have all the years of training you have to do all the competition to get funds and all of the obstacles in the way not the least of which I learned last night uh, at dinner speaking with uh, one of the scientists is the, um, the challenge of industry poaching the best of your <laughs> lab staff. I mean, who thought of, who knew about that? They are almost intimidating in their dedication and passion to it. And I can't, I just can't be thankful enough for that. I think when I'm when I'm in the uh, the, the main uh, meeting hall and listening to some of the presentations, I mean you can feel the energy in the room. It it, it goes up. It changes, and um, and I think that's a, a direct reflection of what they bring to their work, let alone the work itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I just can't. Um praise highly enough the alliance itself, what this group of national MS societies and scientists have accomplished in creating this group and in organizing it and in bringing themselves together, recognizing that even in this time of post-pandemic Zoom meetings and this in-person, um, the value of meeting in person, and exchanging ideas and and um, talking through notions and inspiring each other, it is it's real and it's palpable here, and it means more is going to happen towards a solution or solutions when they get home. You're absolutely right. Well, Manya Joblin, thank you for being a powerful voice in the MS movement and for supporting the work of the International Progressive MS Alliance. And thanks for talking with me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS and our coverage of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Congress. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 304. 
You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. And spoiler alert, there'll be some bonus content available in next week's episode of the podcast. The Real Talk MS app is free. So I hope you'll take a moment and download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices. (laughs) 